I'm Professor Tony Bellini. Thanks so much for joining me today to talk about the right to data privacy, the title of my forthcoming article in Northwestern's Journal of uh, Tech and IP. And this should publish in a couple weeks. I'm making my final edits, so if you have any brilliant ideas, uh, please offer them. Um, this PowerPoint, I am going to limit citations. You can just look at my article if you want cites. And so this actually that made uh, the experience more enjoyable, enjoyable for me putting the PowerPoint together, not worrying about all the sites. So current scholarship versus prior scholarship. Well, my first major article, I focused on teaching technology to law students from an under the hood perspective. And, you know, when I think about just understanding tech, there's to me two prongs. One is understanding how to use software tools. And the other prong is understanding how things work under the hood. And I think that that's important. You know, it's, it's good to know the latest tools, but if you wanna be a leader at the intersection of tech and the law, having some understanding of what's going on under the hood is really helpful. Especially if, you know, you're a lawyer reviewing uh, digital forensic expert witness reports, you know, things like that. Uh, my second scholarly work really acted on this idea. So it's a long article uh, talking about uh, actually implementing this concept and teaching various implementations of encryption and then sprinkling in the relevant legal principles. So that's almost 80 pages long. So if you're having trouble sleeping at night, just pull up that article and it'll, it'll knock you out pretty quick. Okay, but um uh, And of course, this, this Northwestern article, um, I'm being less technical and I'm just talking about information privacy rights generally and my thoughts on what we might do and some major problems. And interestingly, I even talk about feelings in the article. I never thought I'd do that with a scholarly article, talk about feelings. There's no feelings in law. Actually, there are. Uh, so we'll talk about that. And, um, you know, the major idea in this article, I might be crazy for proposing it, is maybe we should start thinking about a constitutional amendment for information privacy that protects against information privacy abuse from both government actors or private actors or the two working together. So we'll talk more about that as we work through this. I wanna start with a quote from Olaf from Disney's Frozen 2, advancing technology is both our savior and our doom. And I think that's a very salient quote because with new tech, we're always assessing what are the benefits and possible harms. And unfortunately, I did not put a picture of, Ol of Olaf in here. I grabbed a public domain stock image, not quite as impactful, but I don't want Disney coming after me. You know, CLE content, you start getting into that commercial uh, space potentially. And certainly, you know, with, with uh, new benefits and harms, everybody's talking about AI right now. And so that's certainly one aspect of this, of this broad theme. So, Key questions for today, how can modern law better adapt to rapidly changing tech and the associated privacy problems? Sub question, am I nuts for proposing a constitutional information privacy amendment? I think the short answer is yes. <laughs> I reached out to uh, Professor Dan Solov at Georgetown, real heavyweight privacy scholar. I said, am I nuts? In a nice way, he said, yeah, you might be nuts. Uh, it's so hard to get a constitutional amendment passed. You know, a lot of attorneys would say, well, this is a non-starter, you know, just give up. Um, but no, I wanted to explore it because I think there's potential benefits and we need to start thinking about how we might improve the US legal system with respect to information privacy. Maybe this could lead to some better ideas, who knows? Um, why use uh, Warren and Brandeis, the right to privacy from 1890 as a starting point. So we'll talk about that. What does 1890 teach us about privacy today? What problems are similar? What problems are new? I actually think it's a great uh, way to start a uh, broad privacy discussion. In fact, this right to privacy article from 1890, it's one of my uh, assigned readings in my data privacy course. And I, and I see lawyers and non-lawyers read this article all the time and they're blown away at how relevant all the ideas are in that article. So I highly recommend it. 
And then I'll talk, of, of course, a little bit about a path forward. So how can modern law better adapt to changing tech and privacy problems? Uh, again, I'm arguing we need a general law broadly and flexibly protecting against information privacy abuse, whether it's government or private actors or the two working together. This would enable courts to restrict clear abuses without waiting for state or federal Congress to act. You know, we have Congress, state or federal, constantly plugging in uh, privacy holes with legislation and a lot of issues that they don't get to because it's hard to pass a law. And why broad and flexible? Well, one, one answer, and I'll have other answers to consider, but one answer, I think it's difficult or impossible to craft detailed legislation for unknown future privacy harms. So I think we need some flexible, broad language. And, you know, we see this with statutes like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, you know, there's all these definitions of personal information, all this stuff, and those different definitions grow stale and need to be changed. And, you know, it's hard to revise the law. So, as I mentioned, broad, flexible, right? Waiting for Congress doesn't work. Congress has contemplated broad privacy law for the last 20 years with no success. So, you know, legislation doesn't seem to be working. It tends to focus solely on consumer protection rather than government and ignores the two working together. I'll have more comments on that. Uh, law enforcement bypassing Carpenter by purchasing location data. Uh, privacy legislation is often crafted by big tech lobbyists. Well, that's kind of disgusting, isn't it? You know, uh, it's sort of like placating consumers, making them feel that they have a sense of privacy while big tech can continue to profit off personal data. That might not be the worst thing as long as it's done, you know, responsibly, but drafted by tech lobbyists, I don't like that. A broad law could better harmonize with European Union's broad protection and the GDPR, General Data Privacy Regulation. The default rule in the US Absent an explicit law addressing a privacy practice, it's potentially allowed. So this is an observation from Professor Solow, Solo, this default rule. If it's not restricted, it's arguably allowed. Notice and consent practice doesn't work. Who reads all these notices? Nobody. Uh, very few people. And, and again, Solov seems to be one of my heroes in this area. He discusses the charade of consent, you know, by continuing to use our website, you agree to our policy, which you're not gonna read. You know, contract law just doesn't seem to work very well. In fact, there's even discussion that he has about how it would be impossible to actually review all the privacy policies that we encounter online every day. It would take hundreds of hours. Um, a broad right of protection avoids the need for courts to infer or imply an information privacy right from existing law. And in the wake of Dobbs v. Jackson, you know, it's something to think about. Reluctance to imply an information privacy right. Because Warren and Brandeis in 1890, they had to imply a right from existing law and a lot of people signed on. And yeah, as I mentioned, Dobbs v. Jackson, inferring, refused to infer privacy right in abortion context uh, this decision was more of a decisional privacy or individual liberty than an information privacy issue, but we're going to explore the differences between decisional privacy and information privacy on this slide. And so how do we distinguish the two? You're probably already getting some ideas on this. One idea is that decisional privacy is arguably not a privacy right at all. Instead, individual liberty or freedom distinct from information privacy. I think that might be a good way to look at it. So we think about our decisional rights, uh, right to travel, right to free speech, right to assemble, make personal health care decisions, things like that. So those are decisional rights, individual liberties from that standpoint. But what makes the, what kind of blurs the lines a bit is that information privacy is related to decisional privacy. So deciding whether to have an abortion, that's sort of an individual decisional freedom. 
But sharing information about whether somebody had an, an abortion, that's information privacy. And it, it's sort of a private issue. You know, it's not something people just openly talk about, right? Um, so that, that definitely bur uh, blurs the lines. But there are other factors that have blurred the lines over the years that I'll get into soon. But what I'm thinking about with information privacy is so the, the Constitution guarantees liberty in the 14th Amendment. And the dissent in Dobbs v. Jackson talks about this. So I view liberty as sort of the, the overarching genus. Information privacy is one component of, of liberty, one component of freedom, of living in a free society. Personal decisions also fall under this umbrella of liberty. Why is information privacy a liberty interest? Well, imagine a country with no, no information privacy. You know, it's not hard to imagine where the government is looking at everything and prosecuting everybody for every possible thing. Let's also consider the Fourth Amendment prohibiting improper search and seizure. That's essentially a privacy law. Your privacy is invaded if the police bust into your home for no reason and search through all your stuff. And then you think about electronic information. Uh, that's also an invasion. And so in my view, a free society minim minimally or reasonably restricts personal liberties, decisions, and also prohibits overreach with surveillance. I think a lot of folks would tend to agree with me on that. Uh, what's reasonable, you know, we could debate whether certain forms of surveillance are reasonable and so forth. I mean, every, every right is restricted, right? The right to free speech, there's qualifications. There's certain things you can't do. You can't incite violence, for example. Uh, why have courts, okay, this is another idea for blurring the lines between decisional privacy and information privacy. Why have courts historically resisted referring to private decisions as falling under constitutional umbrella of liberty? And the answer is the ghost of Lochner versus New York from 1905. This was a very unpopular Supreme Court opinion invalidating a state law that limited bakery employee hours because the court said, well, people have the freedom, the liberty to choose to be a slave laborer and <laughs> work too many hours. So it was a really an, un an unpopular opinion. And so for many decades thereafter, the Supreme Court sort of avoided referring to liberty uh, with decisions affecting privacy. And my article, and I grabbed this idea from Professor Bellin, uh, my article asserts that the ghost of Lochner seems sufficiently exercised since 1905. Maybe to simplify the law, we could again refer to liberty in a broad sense, which again, I think the dissent in Dobbs v. Jackson was kind of pushing in that direction. Uh, and yeah, it might simplify things. Freedom, liberty, you know, overarching principle. What does it mean to live in a free society? That could be sort of a starting point before getting into more specific laws. Uh, again, am I nuts for proposing constitutional information privacy amendment? I, I might be. Uh, extremely difficult to enact, and I'll have uh, some details on that, but the benefits could be significant, so maybe we could start thinking about those benefits. And I think maybe an amendment seems warranted, given that we have so many state and federal laws addressing information privacy, right? I, Graham Leach Bliley Act for financial sector, HIPAA for healthcare sector, sector FERPA for education, uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act for financial stuff, all 50 states having a data breach notification law and requirements uh, for security of personal data. It's, it's just kind of a mess. So we might benefit from sort of an overarching right. Maybe there could be enough bipartisan support. So the hang up with new privacy laws at the federal level, and maybe state level too, uh, private right of action, do you allow individuals to sue for a violation? So maybe if you leave that out, that might be okay. Uh, the other major issue is preemption. If you have a federal law sort of preempting state law, that often causes some hang ups. But could states decide whether to allow a private right of action for violating a constitutional amendment? I have not explored that issue. Maybe that's possible. I don't know. I'd have to think about that. If you have any ideas, let me know. So we have a constitutional amendment protection of information privacy.
privacy abuse, whether committed by government and private actors or the two working together. Uh, government and private actors can work together to abuse privacy. And one example I found, uh, so law enforcement agencies purchasing location data, which bypasses the warrant requirement of Carpenter v. U.S. 2018 SCOTUS decision. So I found sources talking about that. So, okay, that seems like a problem. Oh, Fourth Amendment's not in, not implicated. I, I have a subscription from a private party that tells me where people are, where they've been, where they're going to be. Okay, don't have to worry about a warrant. Uh, now, typically, U.S. Constitution puts limit, limits on government restrictions rather than private actors. But thinking about the Constitution, 13th Amendment abolishing slavery, that applies to private parties and government. I also thought, I didn't really look into this, but the 21st Amendment, I think, prohibition of alcohol, thankfully that was repealed. Uh, <laughs> um, that, I think, would probably apply to private parties uh, selling alcohol as well. Boy, if they got that amendment passed, why can't we do information privacy? I bet the majority of Americans wanted a drink. Uh, <laughs> So broad and flexible language. So one criticism of my proposal is I'm proposing broad, flexible language, right? And uh, well, that's actually the benefit of my proposal. It lacks precision. Uh, judges could decide what information privacy practices uh, are, are abusive when facing new harms. And so the, the flexibility and adaptability, I think, would be a benefit. So when you think of uh, the Bill of Rights, actually Brett Davinger offered me this point uh, months ago. He said, think about the flexible language in the Bill of Rights. Clear and unusual punishment. What is that, the Eighth Amendment? Uh, unreasonable searches and seizures, Fourth Amendment. So courts have to define what that means, and it changes over time, depending on how society perceives uh, these things. So uh, flexibility could be good. That's kind of what constitutional amendments are all about. Um, benefits, different benefits. Uh, broad constitutional amendment could fill gaps in the law. So I found different cases where different state and federal claims were dismissed, uh, unsupported by the complaint, but certain state law constitutional uh, privacy claims survive dismissal. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So that could be really helpful. Um, and let's go. So, uh, filling gaps in the law. So an overarching principle to think about is that neither government nor private actors can be trusted to respect information <laughs> privacy. They will naturally look for gaps or loopholes in the law, sometimes ignore the law. There are cases where big tech platforms have just ignored the law. Cost of doing business, we're going to violate privacy and make profits. And if we get fined, we'll pay the fine. Uh, government actors will prioritize surveillance and crime detection over privacy. And I'm not necessarily criticizing law enforcement. I mean, you know, that's their job, you know, detect and prosecute crime. Sometimes they go too far. Sometimes they're reasonable. Uh, and like I said, this whole idea of purchasing location data and so forth. Um, private actors will favor profits over privacy. And there's a tendency, as I mentioned, maybe placate consumers with a false sense of privacy or mislead consumers in the fine print, you know, that sort of thing. Um, there's actually a famous example from Google years ago. We don't sell your data. Well, that was technically true. <laughs> but what they didn't say is, we don't sell your data to third parties, but we collect all your data, then third parties pay us to direct targeted advertisements to the consumer. So it's, it's a lot of hide the ball. Uh, it, because there's that profit motive, right? It, it makes companies do this. Um, and I think a constitutional amendment could help counter this very natural tendency to look for loopholes and so forth. Another point is that a privacy amendment, I'll say it again, information privacy amendment, that's really important, uh, could override privacy abuses that are ostensibly protected by some statute or other law. And so one example uh, involves mugshots. So 
Years ago, Illinois and other states passed legislation stopping websites for charging fees for removing a person's published mugshot. So there were a lot of these sites, if somebody had a mugshot, mugshot that was in the newspaper, they'd publish it and keep it up for years. You want us to take it down, pay us a fee. And they would claim, well, this is, this is news, it's newsworthy, right? And so in reaction, state congresses passed legislation to, to outlaw this practice of charging fees. But I wonder if you had a strong constitutional amendment, a court could say this is clearly an abuse of information privacy, more so than uh, newsworthy reporting. What if that mugshot's like 10 years old and, that, and you're charging a fee? Come on, that's an abuse. Um, another example that I've seen is Communications Decency Act. So there, for many years, we've had websites where folks can go online anonymously and post def defamatory content about an ex-girlfriend or whatever and say terrible things and post a picture, oh, this, this woman uses drugs and she's a cheater and all this stuff. Boy, and that comes up in a, in a job search with employers and stuff like that, really terrible. And again, these websites would charge a fee to remove the content. You want us to take that down? And they'd assert no liability saying that the Communication Decency Act protects them because, hey, we're just a platform. We didn't put the content up, we're not liable. And so they get to use this as a shield uh, to protect what I think is clearly an information privacy abuse. And so I'm sure there's there's been a lot of talk over the years about amendments to the CDA as one strategy, but how about a, a strong constitutional amendment overriding the CDA and, say, and saying it's unconstitutional to use the CDA in that manner? I think that might be easier than waiting for Congress to act. You know, it, with various laws, will it ever act with certain laws? And so there's an example in California. So I think it's roughly 11 states that have a constitutional privacy right. I'm not sure if they made it precise to be information privacy, but uh, California case, California parental consent statute abortion context violated California constitutional right to privacy. So here a court is basically overriding a statute with a constitutional amendment. So thought-provoking. Broad information, an amendment seems preferable to a broad statute. It would work better. It's harder to pass, but I think it would work better functionally. You'll have these ideas, a later enacted statute might not override a prior statute in some situations. You, you run into statutory interpretation uh, potential problems. So this article I found, uh, more recent statutes overriding prior statutes, but more specific statutes outweighing general statutes. So it could get messy, where I think an amendment would be cleaner. Still possible, I'm, I'm still open to the idea of a broad statute, but anyway, so here's a summary, a very busy slide of difficulties and benefits. And so hard to enact, that's the difficulty. Proposed amendment must be passed by two thirds of both houses of Congress, ratified by legislatures of three-fourths of the states, that takes a lot of effort. And that's why I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I'm, I'm sure there have probably been hundreds of proposed amendments and they just don't go anywhere because of all the work that it takes uh, to get it enacted. Um, but the benefits, as I mentioned, harmonization with EU's GDPR. So the US has a sectoral approach, you know, privacy laws and the health space, financial space, et cetera. Europe's GDPR does have a broad overarching uh, privacy right. And so some harmonization could be helpful if we're thinking about international data transfers. As I mentioned, filling gaps in the law, that could be helpful. Third, avoids problem of courts refusing to apply constitutional right post Dobbs. Um, could override statutes or common law principles asserted as protection, reduces need to wait for legislatures to act, establishes a baseline for states and Congress to enact further detailed legislation, broad language would allow courts to adapt to new harms, address unknown new harms, and again, uh, finally avoids statutory interpretation issues. So an amendment's preferable to statute, I, I think. 
Okay, why use Warren and Brandeis from 1890 as the starting point? Historical frame of reference. I think it's important to learn from history to avoid repeating the same mistakes, gather insights. And it's also 1890s simpler time in terms of tech and legal principles. So I think it's a great starting point uh, from that standpoint. And again, the, this 1890 article, it's considered the most, by many, the most influential legal essay of all time, still highly valued today. It's worth a read. History jokes. I was watching Netflix, comedian Shane Gillis, studying history as early onset Republican. I don't know, I thought that was funny. Um, major lesson from 1890, new tech brings new privacy harms. That's the lesson from 1890, it's still true today. The new tech of 1890, this was the birth of mass media. You could even call it newspapers, information technology. Sure, why not, printing presses. And so mass printing and rapid photography, maybe it took a day or two to get photos in a newspaper, I don't know. Uh, key similarities is that sharing of personal information like in gossip columns, yellow journalism, false or misleading stories, we still have those same problems today. The temptation to print, I, I should say publish online, uh, false or misleading stories, clickbait, right? Um, Warren and Brandeis had to infer broad information privacy right from existing law, and that's similar today because we don't have an overarching law. Could the refusal in Dobbs to imply a decisional privacy right sort of bleed over into other decisions to uh, refusing to imply information privacy right? I think that's a possibility, and I have to comment, uh, there was a portion of Dobbs where Justice Kavanaugh said, don't worry, this decision is limited to the abortion context and will not affect other issues. And I remember reading that thinking, that's not the way Supreme Court opinions work. <laughs> this will absolutely affect uh, cases in other areas of law. And, and in fact, I saw a news article about a month or so after Dobbs where um, somebody was challenging, challenging a city's vaccine requirement and relying on Dobbs you know, uh, for that. Uh, so yeah, anyway. I'll try not to complain too much about that opinion. <laughs> um, but key differences, when we think about the differences 1890 versus today, we have greater speed and scale of information dissemination. That's one difference. So it's like newspapers, it's just a lot faster. There's a lot more of it. But also data collection, that's really a key difference. And another difference, I would argue that private thoughts are now discoverable, right? And those private thoughts can be manipulated. The Cambridge Analytical uh, scandal, uh, scandal with uh, Facebook psychologically profiling users and then trying to influence their, their voting. So private thoughts, I, I believe, are discoverable. And a good example of private thoughts and just the, how you could learn everything about a person with electronic data, the Jesse Smollett prosecution a couple of years ago. So the judge signed off on these warrants, you know, all the emails, all the location data from Google, historical web history data, um, private messages, including sent mail, drafts, deleted messages. You could imagine if you have everything on a person in terms of online activity for like a full one year period, you could learn anything about that person, anything and everything romantic, family relationships, medical issues, career issues, sexual or political interests, you know, everything about a person. Browsing history, you know, you could, they could have even requested data from vehicles and other devices, but this was probably sufficient. So um, actually I, I put drafts in bold, this was kind of interesting. There's an old intelligence trick. Uh, they caught General, General Petraeus years ago was having an affair and he and his mistress both had a password to a Gmail account. And so they just exchange messages by looking at the draft messages. So you never have to send or transmit the message. So it's kind of a, an old trick. Apparently the prosecutor uh, was hip to this trick and, and said, we wanna see drafts too. So fun stuff. So today tech now has the godlike power to determine everything about a person. Where have you been? Where are you now? Where are you going? It can predict where you're going. We've all seen that, right? Uh, you know, Google Maps says, hey, you wanna go here? Who do you spend time with? 
political philosophical beliefs, spending or purchasing patterns, medical issues, sexual orientation, orientation, sexual or pornography preferences, just about anything, right? I know it's weird to bring it up, but we're talking about privacy. This is private information. You know, you don't share all that at work, right? <laughs> um, so private thoughts and invasive surveillance. So in 1968, Alan Weston offered his opinion that invasive surveillance should only be used for national security and major crimes. And I think a lot of folks still cling to this idea. It sounds about right. Now, Smollett had a felony charge. So was it justifiable? I don't know. I guess arguably could have been justifiable, but it's something to think about. What, what are the crimes or offenses that justify intense electronic surveillance? It's just a question for us to think about. Um, similarities. 1890 newspapers, did they have a temptation to print false or misleading stories? Absolutely, we have the same problem today. Did 1890 newspapers want to keep your eyes on the page to see those ads? Absolutely, it's the same thing online, right? Uh, when I, whenever I pull up a recipe, it seems like I go to some site and I'm trying to find the ingredients and steps, I have to scroll through and it's just ad after ad on so many of these sites. They want to keep your eyes on the page. And there's certainly the, the clickbait issue where there's a misleading uh, title in a news story, things like that. And my article references a source that describes in the 1870s, all major newspapers were considered appendages of political parties. I think we have similar perceptions today, right? We could probably think of news sources that seem to lean a certain way. And so there's this biblical expression that I thought of, you know, nothing new under the sun. I actually, some things are new compared to 1890. Um, I guess side comment, you know, when I think about the growth of technology, so the telegraph, you know, the internet is basically Samuel Morse's telegraph on steroids. <laughs> you know, uh, maybe I'll talk about that more later. I don't know. Too much of a tangent. I've been called Professor Tangent. Uh, so newspaper could publish within X number of days. Today, information published faster, easily accessible. Ward and Brand Brandeis offered an idea that I express in my article as junk begets more junk. <laughs> and so if people buy those gossip columns, they'll buy more. And so this is kind of an amplification principle that has really become worse uh, in recent years. And I'll talk about that with these lower bullets. But can a printed newspaper sense who you are and your various attributes and your purchasing activity? No. So that's a major difference, right? So ads today are far more targeted. Other content is more targeted. And so amplification on social media, um, well, social media can sense which stories you like and feed you more of those stories. And so in my article, I talk about <coughs> increased polarization in society. And so you could look at the Social Dilemma website and, of course, the movie to, to learn about polarization. You know, if you're left-leaning, it'll feed you more left-leaning content. So if you're right-leaning, it feeds you more of that. And it just amplifies those viewpoints. And you're not seeing both sides because you keep getting fed the same stuff. And it's hard to have a, an impartial opinion. And then everybody is really fighting with each other intensely. You know, go red team, go blue team. They want to punch each other. It's terrible. Um, feelings and privacy. Okay, so now we'll talk about feelings. I, so talk about, I never thought I'd talk about feelings in a law class. Although I did, I did play guitar in a copyright law class a couple of years ago because it related to the subject matter, so that was cool. Anyway, tangent. All right. <laughs> so Ward and Brandeis observed that feelings underlie a desire for privacy, a human's need for unobserved solitude, some private time and space. I think we all need that. Different people to different degrees, of course. And eavesdropping or surveillance can cause discomfort. Now, some legal claims might allow liability for hurt feelings. So if you have like intentional infliction of emotion, emotional distress, intrusion up, uh, upon seclusion, you know, some of those claims uh, based on hurt feelings work if the feelings are sufficiently and objectively hurt. Uh, but other decisions, hurt feelings are not enough. So there are cases that find no standing where plaintiff merely alleges a fear of future identity theft based on some data breach. Courts, courts seem to be swinging the other way on that 
in recent years, but uh, hurt feelings could go either way. What's interesting is uh, I went on Westlaw, I searched expert witness reports, privacy and proximity to psychological distress. I found almost 100 expert witness reports, started looking through them. Okay, so there's a relationship between feelings and privacy. Uh, the EU's constitution, known as the Charter of Fundamental uh, Rights, expresses, expressly considers privacy as a human right, which is interesting. Um, and I, in my article, I very briefly offered a suggestion. You could probably insert privacy into Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I didn't go very far with that. It's not a psychology article, but it's interesting to think about the importance of privacy. And so when I think about feelings and privacy, freedom or liberty is really a feeling. Do you feel free or do you feel restricted? And people have different levels of their need for freedom. You know, one person might move out to the countryside where there's less regulation. Another person might live in a high rise with a lot of rules. Um, and again, privacy, a component of liberty, that is, that is a feeling. It's part of this feeling of freedom. A search of your home is an invasion of your freedom, an invasion of your privacy. Regular search of an inmate's cell, that's absolutely, that's no freedom at all, right? You're in prison getting your stuff searched every week. A search of your electronic data, so we can think about this. Does it feel more invasive or less invasive? Well, they're different, aren't they? So there's much more data about you in electronic form versus printed form uh, because of all the data collection, right? But an invasion of your living space has a different feeling. So both are bad. And some people might perceive one as worse than the other. I don't know. Consumer surveillance. Opinions vary on targeted ads. Uh, consumer tracking. Some people say, I don't care at all. Other people don't like it. They don't like that they're being surveilled. Um, some consumers, I think myself included, might not mind Amazon tracking purchases and suggesting products they might wish to purchase. Oh, looks like you might be out of paper towels. Oh, you know, that sort of thing. Of course, I try not to buy paper towels on Amazon, all the packaging, bad for the environment. <laughs> but Amazon, I don't think Amazon does this, but what if Amazon sold your information to third parties who blasted your phone and email with junk every day? You know, then you'd probably be offended. Your sense of privacy would be offended from that standpoint. Consumers can feel creeped out by advertisers knowing where they will be traveling to. Oh, you're going to Maryland? Here's an ad for a rental car in Maryland. You know, people might sometimes feel uneasy about that sort of thing. Possible privacy abuse. I found a source talking about possible price discrimination. So online sites are tracking everything about you. Seller upcharges for flower delivery. It knows a spouse needs flowers the day of his anniversary. So instead of 20 bucks, it's going to be $45. So you could see, you could imagine some sort of privacy abuses from that standpoint, from tracking uh, consumer, tracking consumers. Warren and Brandeis considered the impact of unknown future tech. So there, this is like their Nostradamus moment, actually probably better than Nostradamus. <laughs> he just kind of threw out a bunch of ideas and some of them stuck. But Warren and Brandeis, the dangers of the two enterprising press, the photographer, any other modern device for rec recording or producing scenes or sounds. It's not just the devices, it's also the storage capability. If you can store years and years of video footage at lower cost every year, that, that there's some privacy implications there. And let's talk about camera footage as an example, okay? So at DePaul, and probably most buildings, building security footage in common areas, you know, they don't have them in the restrooms or whatever. You have no expectation of privacy walking through the hallways. It's basically a public area. Okay, so, so far, no problem with security cameras recording your activity in the building. Vendor comes along and offers cheap data storage to DePaul and lots of other buildings in the city. Hey, you know, store for very low cost. Okay, yeah, let's do it, that's a good deal. Then the vendor applies facial recognition to all the footage, starts selling location and other data to law enforcement, as well as data brokers for consumer profiling. So this is a privacy issue called 
contextual integrity. Data is collected for one purpose, building security, but then used for an entirely different purpose. And with a lot of this, I mean, if, uh, if we didn't have Illinois BIPA for facial recognition jurisdiction like that, right, maybe you could do this, that default rule, right? If it's not restricted, it's probably allowed. Uh, let's talk about AI. So generative AI can produce realistic working <coughs> description and sites for false defamatory content. Maybe you've seen that. You could, you know, create an article that talks about this person being, you know, terrible and committing all sorts of crimes and uh, realistic content. We have to worry about this. I was reading a source that's saying that, uh, that was saying in the very near near future, it's probably already happening. Over ninety percent of inter internet content will be bot generated, and I'm actually I'm seeing a lot of bot activity. Like I've gone on Facebook. Try not to go on there too much, but go on Facebook and I see some ads. We're selling our music gear. You know, here's a Gibson Les Paul guitar for $100. We're going out of business. And I look at it. This is clearly counterfeit stuff. Okay, way to go, Facebook. We're just a platform. <laughs> and uh, then I respond and I say, well, okay, well, you're clearly selling counterfeit stuff. Then all the bots start responding. No, the seller's great. All their products are legit. They're the best ever. You know, so there's all this bot traffic that we have to think about. Um, second bullet, lawyers might often prefer predictive AI rather than generative. So there was a story in the news months back. New York lawyers sanctioned for false uh, AI-generated briefs. So there are companies right now working on AI legal research and drafting tools that are sh shooting for accurate uh, briefs. AI could potentially re-identify individuals using anonymized or pseudonymized data on the web if they can put the pieces together and say, oh yeah, that's that person. So AI could use public data available for one purpose and then repurpose it for some other. And so that's the contextual integrity problem uh, that I mentioned earlier. Predictive policing. So the Germans have been on top of data privacy for many years. And uh, they found a predictive policing practice unconstitutional, finding it violated broad rights to informational self-determination, whatever that is, a broad information privacy right. And that makes me think, well, maybe the US could benefit from a similar right. Um, 2002, was it 2002? It seems like it should be older. Uh, specialized pre-crime pre police force, arrested criminals before commission of a crime. So kind of far-fetched, but actually police departments around the country are using predictive policing tools, you know, looking for certain behaviors, predicting whether someone might commit a crime in a particular area, that sort of thing. So something to think about. Privacy by design, that's a new concept. Likely not a concern for development of new products and services in 1890, um, although telegraphs were easily wiretapped. So those started in the 1840s, telegraphs through, I don't know, maybe the 1960s. I, telegraphs were around a long time. Um, actually, one of the first cases, first recorded cases of electronic eavesdropping, 1862, a stockbroker tapped the telegraph lines to get insider information for stock trades. Isn't that cool? Another idea, telephone systems for decades were easy to, uh, to eavesdrop on. They were an open system. You know, there's like a switchboard operator. You could just tap in, listen to everything. In fact, local police used to just listen to calls um, and private detectives. Uh, much of the internet, much of the internet, it's just Ellen, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> Much of, the, I didn't know <laughs> much of the internet's development did not contemplate privacy and security. So in recent decades, the internet was developed as largely an open communication system. So recent decades, we're sort of retrofitting this system. Really good example is the switch from HTTP to HTTPS, which browsers now favor HTTPS. The S stands for secure, and that means that a lot of your data is encrypted on the internet. And that was the Electronic Frontier Foundation campaign for that, which I think was a helpful change. Cybersecurity is a new concept compared to 1890, right? Uh, 
However, encryption of printed data, that's been around for thousands of years. If you think about the Julius Caesar cipher and then through World War II and even later, variations of the Caesar cipher, you know, increasingly complicated mathematically. But a difference, more data can be hacked today. There's much more electronic information. When we think about the storage, you know, storage gets better every year and cheaper. Uh, versus hacking someone's handwritten diary or personal letters, there's not going to be as, as much information about a person in, let's say, a printed uh, handwritten diary or something like that in 1890. Privacy and security have evolved into more distinct concepts. So 1890, privacy and security were probably assessed together. I've got private papers. I put them in a safe. Analysis done, right? But today, let's think about an organization could have very strong security, encryption, firewalls, network monitoring, data backups, intrusion detection, all sorts of antivirus, but have huge privacy exposure. How could this be? How could you have very strong security, but weak privacy? And the answer, collecting data that it shouldn't collect sharing it without authorization with third parties. Those sorts of things can trigger liability. And so today, organizations might separately assess security and privacy, where in 1890, the analysis was much simpler, throw it in a safe, you're done, right? Disinformation and free speech. Private platforms policing speech on social media. And as a private platform, not bound by the First Amendment, right? So we start thinking of a government actor versus private actor. But then you think about majority of Amer Americans on Facebook, adult Americans, large number of working Americans on LinkedIn. And the question, and this is an unpopular idea, but I think about it anyway, is social media akin to a public space? Will it become even more so akin to a public, like a public street, right? Um, I think probably, the, and, and people debate that. When I talk to law students, they seem to say, yeah, I like censorship of speech on social media, okay. Uh, Best strategy, I think, focus on reducing financial incentives to propagate disinformation. And so, you know, a large scale commercial enterprise, you know, publishing fake stories, trying to get clicks and traffic and all that, that's one scenario versus the average Joe or Jane going on Facebook and, and expressing a political opinion that might be unpopular, you know, that sort of thing. I think the average Joe or Jane, you know, we might want to allow some of that but the big, big enterprises publishing a lot of fake information, I think liability might be good or, or reducing the financial incentives. And so one idea, if Facebook, this, this will never happen, but if Facebook required opt-in consent for data collection, that limits commercial actors' ability to uh, feed you fake info, assess your interest in it, they can't really track you. So opt-in consent, that's Europe. Opt-out consent is USA. And, and that's not going to change. The US economy is addicted to personal data, so I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, side note, what are these things? Opt-out consent. By continuing to use our site, you agree to our privacy policy. Opt-out consent, pre-check box. Yes, please send me marketing emails. You have to uncheck the box. You know, the default is we're gonna track you and send you stuff. Opt-in consent in Europe, consumer has to affirmatively sign up for data collection or whatever else. And as I said, US opt out, Europe is opt in. I don't see that changing. Even with a new uh, information privacy amendment, if that ever happened, opt out consent is not necessarily abusive. So, and again, there's a lot of big tech lobbying that would want to maintain opt out consent. Legal similarities. So Warren and Brandeis talk about all sorts of legal principles and how they're insufficient to protect privacy. And they talk about tort laws insufficient to protect privacy. That's still true today. You'll have tort law claims that fail. Or I talked about Communication Decency Act uh, being a, a shield. We talked about reasonable expectation of privacy test failing, you know, for public spaces and then, you know, using that information. The camera footage example, similar with license plate uh, scammer, uh, scanners. That's very unregulated. So you can do the same thing with license plate scanners as, as cameras track people, who's hanging out with who, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, contract law is still insufficient. 
there's no contractual relationship between data scraper and a consumer and who, who reads the cookie note, who reads the contact uh, contracts, you know, the privacy policies. Fiduciary law still insufficient, same idea as contract law. Copyright law still insufficient to protect privacy. Facts about a person, those are non-copyrightable ideas. Property law still insufficient to protect privacy, especially data collected in public spaces, you know, who owns it, you know. Uh, publishing newsworthy info may still override privacy interests. So in 1890, the authors talked about this, and that's still true today. Um, so Warren and Brandeis said some people renounce their, the right to live their lives screened from public observation. That's still true today. So uh, a few years ago, about 10 years ago, there was this Hulk Hogan. Do you know who that is, Hulk Hogan? Sex tape case. Uh, he had discussed his sex life in like books and other fora. And so this was no longer a private area of his life. So he wasn't really able to block the media from publishing, you know, portions of the sex tape or whatever it was. So still true today. Path forward. Um, I think supporting individual liberties, including information, privacy, and free speech is really important. Um, comments on, on free speech. You know, you, you have to support even unpopular speech because opinions change. So an example I think of the feminist movement of the 1970s, I'm sure there were a lot of voices opposing unpopular feminist views in the 1970s, but there were some really good things that came out of that movement, right? Uh, and so hopefully feminist professors may have been protected by tenure and that's sort of thing, the free speech rights. Because actually the, the feminist movement identified that uh, minors were being sexually exploited in film not only young girls, but young boys. And they said, this is wrong. And so that, that led to the development of child pornography laws. And so you think about what if those voices had been silenced? So there might be some unpopular viewpoints today that should be, should be heard, you know? Uh, again, contemplate constitutional amendment. And, and there's a concern that contraction of one right could lead to contraction of other rights. So the dissent in Dobbs v. Jackson talked about this. If you lose one of your freedoms, it could lead to loss of other freedoms. Slippery slope argument, sure, but it might be true. Something to think about. Uh, one thing that I've thought about over the years, so post-Patriot Act many years ago, greatly reduced financial privacy in the United States. You, you know, various transactions are reported and discoverable. And pre-Dobbs, I thought, well, maybe this is okay. You know, the US is not an authoritarian regime and all right, it's. People want to hide their money. It's probably tax evasion. But then after Dobbs, I said, gosh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure anymore. Maybe this privacy is important. The possibility of states attempting long arm jurisdiction to prosecute out of state abortions. Will they have access? Um, yes, additional benefits of feminist movement, uh, women's rights, uh, attempting long arm jurisdiction, discovering financial uh, transactions, location data, things like that. Right. Um, and so, yeah, now I'm not sure. Uh, and again, can't practically craft detailed legislation for unknown future harms. Change default rule in the U.S. Make express what Warren and Brandeis had to imply. Maybe it's time. Counter the natural tendency for government private actors to favor other interests than information privacy. Harmonize with the EU. Train law students on tech to better understand legal tech issues. You know, maybe some of our law students will become Congress, Congress people. Uh, knowledge of IT from under the hood perspective. Yeah. Uh, development of new laws, regulations, executive orders in tech space. We just had executive orders. So knowledge of the tech really helps. Um, I'll wrap up soon. Um, yeah, I mean, I had to consider privacy of DNS over HTTPS, and there was like lawyers and law professors discussing this topic a few years ago. And I realized the lawyers, this is very common, the lawyers couldn't really assess the issue because you have to understand how DNS works, how HTTPS works, the shortcomings from a privacy standpoint, how an ISP could still track websites visited. You know, you need enough tech, technical knowledge, not enough to do IT work, but enough to understand what's going on. So. Uh, we're out of time, so I'm not going to talk about license plate scanners, but I'll say it's one important privacy issue, very important privacy issue moving forward. The ACLU has filed some suits on this topic, and uh, 
I guess I have a minute. So I was picking up some furniture in a small town in Illinois, a subdivision. And the homeowner said, just so you know, we have a license plate scanner at the entrance to the subdivision and it shares your license plate with the local police. And they check whether the car is stolen and it's for security and safety. Good to know. I don't think my car is stolen. I think we're good. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know, maybe it's okay if the police just, just do a quick check against stolen cars and then immediately delete the information. Maybe that could be okay. But what if they're doing other things? putting it into some huge database and then selling it to agencies around the country who can access my location data and everybody else's without a warrant and then sharing it with uh, data brokers, you know, oh, Tony Bellini, that's his car. Where's he going? Where's he been? You know, uh, who is he hanging out with? What stores is he visiting and all this stuff. And so it kind of makes you think um, that the need for a broad privacy uh, law can be very helpful. So. Uh, thank you so much for listening. If you have any ideas, come see me or reach out. Thank you very much, everyone. Questions? We have sure. questions online. I'll try. What about a uh, federal agency to oversee information privacy? Yeah, we have, uh, in a broad sense, yes, very, very open to that. Uh, we have the FTC. <clears throat> If you're not in the health sector or financial, well, FTC uh, has the, sort of the broadest jurisdiction for that. So we, we have that, um, but I don't, I don't know if that's enough, but it's a good idea. Uh, but I think the constitutional amendment would still be worthwhile. With the constitutional amendment, who, uh, two questions. Would there be a concern that because abuse is such a vague term that by the time that is litigated, technology will have progressed so far advanced that it would be a new thing and it would be the laws constantly trying to catch up to what data abuse could actually mean? It's a great question because the law will always struggle to keep up with new tech. Maybe, maybe a theory is that uh, you could resolve the problem quicker in the courts than waiting for Congress. And again, the question also brings up this idea of the lack of precision in the definition. That's the criticism, but it's also the possible benefit. I think you could more quickly file a lawsuit based on a constitutional provision than lobbying Congress to pass a law. Uh, do you have any other questions in the room? All right, well, thanks so much, everyone.